really thrilled to have you here for this very special event. And I'm going to ask Uncle Mikla to start with a welcome to country. Ginege no jawi. Baba wo moranya no jawi ulu dalala. Moral kuni julu beraya no jawi. Nia yari julu moral kuni moral julu nia mandi. Nanyu di pijam Mikla. Naya umba yang jadi yang berpakai pakainya, taruh di jalan ini yang ego. Bapa ko murang, ia nyoba yuru darala, kujang niya cakuntu. We are blessed by the land. Kujang niya gilungku. We are blessed by the ancestors. Kujang niya garlo. We are blessed by the ocean. Kujang niya moyolo. We are blessed by the spirits. Nayam Bumbangir Yamaja Bumbangir. He? He? He died, he died, he died. Bumbangir, spirit in this land forever. Bumbangir, spirit inside me forever. I am Bumbangir because this land is Bumbangir and this is where the great ancestral being, Yulada, planted. The language in this, and I am connected to each part of this land because it is linked to the Gumbangia language. Daroye lamin Gumbang, daroye lamin Gumbangi the Jagunda. Welcome to Gumbanga homeland. Daroye lamin Bali Jagunda. Welcome to Bali Jagunda. Daroye mo tuli niya ngayon. Good to see you all. Daroye mo daroye mo thank you. Hard to follow that. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Siegel. I'm from the Center for Ecological Learning, and I'm really pleased to have you all here for part of the, for, to be part of this event. I also want to well, I want to pay my deep and abiding respects to Umbanga elders, past, present, and emerging, and just express my gratitude for being able to live on this beautiful land every day. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the land was never ceded, and that this land always was and always will be Umbanga land. Um, let's see. Thanks again for the enthusiasm. We, this is the third time we've done this event over the past four years. And I've been telling everybody, um, I basically made a Facebook event, sent it out to our newsletter at one time, and it was sold out within a few weeks. That shows me that there is a real need and a real desire to learn more about both spirit and science. So this event is um, part of, it's brought to you by the Center for Ecological Learning on behalf of the Coast Coast Regional Science Hub, which is an initiative of Inspiring New South Wales, supported by the New South Wales government. Yay, they're doing something good. And they are getting science out into the communities um, in innovative, interesting, and um, new ways, exciting ways, um, by sponsoring events like this. So, um, what what we're going to do tonight? Um, so, the initiative has been running over three or four years, and it'll keep continuing. So, keep watching this space. And a lot of people were disappointed because they couldn't come tonight, um, but I think. There's such a beautiful partnership here between Mark and Uncle Miklo that I have no doubt that we'll continue this conversation. So how we're going to run tonight is um, I'm, going to, I'm going to introduce both of these uh, lovely humans and then they're going to be in conversation for about an hour. Um, we'll see if that actually happens, if, or if it might go over an hour if I know them. But then we'll hopefully have time at the end for some questions from you all. So, I'm going to introduce these two beautiful people. Uncle Miklo, Uncle Michael Jarrett, also known as Uncle Miklo, is a well-known and much-loved Kumbanger elder, um, who you will have seen probably in many places providing Welcome to Country ceremonies at many events, as well as leading Indigenous language classes, camps, cultural storytelling. Um, Uncle Nicholas is from Nambaka Heads, but he was born in Maxville and grew up and spent most of his adult life on Bellwood Reserve, surrounded by family. Um, but it wasn't until he was 
uh, working as an early childhood educator in 1997 that he decided to attend Gumbenger language classes. So Uncle Mikla didn't grow up speaking language. And I thought that's important to share. Um, but the like, he enrolled in, it in um, the Gumbenger classes at Murabai Language Center, which, which we're really blessed to have in our local area. And um, he might tell you more about it, but it was hard work learning language. But um, he persevered and then practiced with his um, little ones at preschool. Um, then enrolled in a master's in indigenous um, of languages education, which is what university was that? Yeah. New South Wales, University of New South Wales. And the rest is history, that we have this amazingly um, knowledgeable educator here in our midst, who is in every school that I see. And he's also a bit of a, um, so he teaches, he works for the New South Wales Department of Education and TAG and other language organizations. He runs um, classes here in Belgium, and he's also a bit of a YouTube star. <laughs> Google, if you Google him, you'll see just heaps of really cool videos teaching you everything about and telling stories that often do that. Um, so I personally just, it's more than just Uncle Mikva's knowledge, it's the passion and his massive heart that shines through and inspires so many people. So I'm really um, pleased that he could be here to share more of that big heart with us and yeah, thank you for being here. And we're also lucky to have another amazing and passionate teacher with us tonight. Um, Mark Graham is our official scientist here. He is <laughs> You're very special. You're not wearing a white coat or anything. But Mark studied applied science in uni and then became um, an ecologist and has worked for years and years in a wide variety of um, positions in government, in private organizations, in, in public organizations, kind of too many to, in politics, um, and a little bit too many to mention. When I met Mark years ago, it was, I, I was introduced to him as the frog man, because he knows everything about frogs, but I, um, and I still send him pictures of frogs and ask him what they are, but I, I soon found out how much Mark knows about every single, every creature in the whole entire planet, trees included. Um, the, the mind is unbelievable. And and not only, and it's the same thing, that, and which is why I think these two get along so well, it's not just that knowledge that Mark has, but the absolute passion and love for the other than human world um, that he carries into his teaching and his sharing and his storytelling. And both of these men, besides that passion for the other than human world, also have a passion for the human world and really um, care about making things better and um, moving us towards a more sustainable, beautiful future that's in balance. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I'll be quiet now and let you two start. There's a little bit of PowerPoints, there's a little bit of things that you might um, need some help with. Um, and then I'll keep you, I'll tell you when about an hour is gone, and we'll work it out from there. Darren Mountjinda. I love listening to this man. Every time he says something, I will go, what? We were talking, we were talking, uh, 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 what day were we over there? Monday. Monday, we are talking Monday. And, and then it come in and, and talk, started talking again, and this, this beautiful stuff, beautiful, beautiful stuff. You know, uh, my Gumbaka people have been living on this land for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They had a way of uh, coexisting with nature and with everything that's in this, in the, on this planet. One of the philosophies of Gumbaka people was to keep life going. Yeah? Keep life going, but not only that, but to make it better. And the way that they did this was not to threaten the existence of anything on the planet and respect the autonomy of everything that's on this planet. And um, you know, our, our stories go our stories go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We've got stories about how the ocean 
uh, creeped up, you know, kind of, uh, stories about flooding of the land and the Humbanga people running to a mountain out in uh, Mount Karamba, you know, seeking refuge there and uh, how the, uh, the language has got put into this country and how the Palakos and the Emu come to the belt. We've got all these dream kind of stories um, that we live by and the Murabai tree. And these stories tell us how to go coexist and what happens in the planet and on the earth. So not only here, if you, uh, we got our sacred places on this earth, we got our sacred places. We're making people got sacred places where they go and they do their ceremony. So when they do their ceremony, every part of the universe is connected to other parts of the universe. When we do our ceremony on country, increase sites to make the food more uh, uh, prevalent, then not only are we are being connected to other parts of the world and the universe when we do our uh, ceremonies. And, you know, growing up on the Aboriginal Reserve in them Heads, there were uh, men and women there who spoke fluent Gumbangia. They were initiated, uh, 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 men and women, and it was a privilege to see some of these uh, um, men and women how uh, beautiful they were. You know, they, they were really, really beautiful in their spirit and in their knowledge and in the, in the way that they um, interacted with all the community and, and the uh, planet itself. And, you know, I didn't learn language growing up. But back in 1997, I made sure these old people left um, messages for us now to tell everybody on they, they were called they were real to real and then there were uh, written documents so these old people t uh, left messages for us the Gumbaga elders got taken from Gumbaga homeland and put into Dangati territory so in back in 1983 the Gumbanga elders over there decided that they wanted to keep their language and culture alive because they saw the decline of the Gumbanga language and culture and there was getting fewer and fewer speakers. So they started up a language uh, group and they got a guy called Brother Steve Morelli and they taught him everything about the uh, Gumbanga stuff, you know, uh, and they, they found, they also searched for records. Um, in Iatsas, and we even found some in the attic in America, where a guy called Lavis. Um, you know, there was all these records in Catholic Church, the police stations, we we're finding all stuff about Gumbangia people, and um, the old, the elders that were in 1985 uh, in Kempsey also had the knowledge that um, we recorded as well. So there is still a lot of stuff that's in the Murabai Language Center that has not been released yet. There are some stuff that will never be released because it's too, too powerful and too straight, uh, too sacred for the, uh, for uh, you know, Marcus said that you know, there was a tree down there called we call it a diamond tree, and um, when they were all sitting around talking, he said the tree is dying. The tree was dying. This diamond tree was dying, and because there was no one else that left to talk to this tree. And um, he said, when people were around talking to this tree, that this tree used to just shine bright. So these diamonds, car, uh, diamonds were carved into this tree. And uh, unfortunately, it, it fell down. Uh, but the place is still sacred, you know, to, to all manner of people and to men, uh, men's place. But, you know, uh, you know, living on this land for thousands and thousands of years, and that knowledge that we, we keep getting back out of Murabai, I'm, I'm learning as much as I can and teaching as much, many people as possible, you know, about the seasons and about the uh, animals that live there and totems and all that stuff. And I'll shut up. Go. <laughs> I can go all over, do I? I've got a, a confession to make, and it's something that I feel keenly responsible for and about. Um, I don't speak much Gumbangi and I've not applied myself at this stage to learning Gumbangi language. And I've been lucky to have been in this nation most of my life, going back to the late 1970s. And this land 
has been so uh, profound in how it's influenced my existence. And I feel incredibly blessed and privileged to have been on this country for 40 or so years and to have gained insights into what makes this country tick. And I guess that's how and why Miklo and I um, come to be here tonight and what we do together. And I guess as a scientist, I'd like to share some of the insights doing and to be doing together. We need to be custodians of land and water and the creatures within the land. Um, and we need to take that responsibility incredibly seriously. And we need to do whatever we possibly can to keep country healthy, to keep water clean, to keep water flowing. Um, because it's those elements that support and sustain us all. Um, mountains up here, 1,500 metres, snow-capped peaks, right down onto the coast where you can basically go from these astonishing near tropical systems to snow-capped mountains periodically. And there's practically nowhere else on the planet where that's possible. And those realms, that's, that's where we live, that's where we play, that's what sustains us. And the, the wisdom that comes from the dream time, I think, is... Um, something that we all need to grab hold of and work together to embody the health of the country. The quote that Miklo always makes about everything being interconnected, science absolutely validates and verifies that, that every single action that we take has a, a reaction and a consequence, a ripple through space and time. And the living fabric of life is, is the most important and sacred element within this nation. There's some elements to it that I think we can, we can kind of um, unpack as, as, as we go along. Darandam Joranga, I told you it was good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to show a video, a short video of um, one of the, uh, the dreaming stories from the Bellington River. Babagung orang nyanyi wajar yulu darala. Meralgun di julu gurai yarang jagi nia yari julu meralgun di meral julu nia mbandi. Yui! Nyam ngaya gungumbu garaway bari nyagai gu galau na dawara. Nyam gai nganyu di barmaran gungumbu bin galau na ngalgira. Nyam Nanyundi wajar, yam nginundi wajar, nia perkungum buwala. Yam kumbengir gundi wajar, kumbengir gundi pindere, kumbengir gundi jagun. Ngaya yam kumbengir jamper, ngaya baga baga nyer, daro ingudilinya nyaga ego. Bindere windala, it means a river in the stars. So in the Bindarei Windala, the Gugamgan lives. And in the Milky Way, the emu lives. This is a story about the emu and the platypus. Long ago in the Yuladara, the dream time, there were two young boys. They said to their clan, the Budabang clan, we are gonna go up the river and catch lots of fish. So the two boys headed off up the river. They took two poles with them. They got to a place called Thora and they got vine and they got grass and they weaved it together on these two sticks. They made a net, the first net. They put each pole on the side of the river and they waited all night. All night they waited and come back in the morning. When they looked in the net, the net was empty. And the kookaburra laughed. <coughs> and the two boys felt so ashamed, really felt ashamed, because they told everyone that they were gonna catch all this fish. Now they got nothing. One boy said, I'm not going back. And he jumped in the river 
He started swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming. As he swam, he transformed into a beautiful, beautiful little platypus, shy, so he'd never hardly seen. So when people come near him, he'll swim away. The other boy was so scared to go back without his cousins, he started running on the north side of the Bellinger, all the way from Thora down to Bellington River. As he ran and he ran and he ran, he got close to Bellingen, he started transforming into this beautiful, beautiful emu. And he kept running and running and running. And now all the emus are along the coastal areas from this one emu. So every time an emu sees a man, he runs away because he's ashamed that he didn't catch the fish. And that's the story about the emu and the platypus how it come into the uh, Bellingen Valley. Up until the 1980s, there were lots of emus along the east coast. But due to disruption to the way of Gumbanger people and not looking after country anymore, these emus have slowly started to disappear. Now we have less than 50 left. So it's very important that we all everybody has a responsibility to look after these emus. Emu in Gumbangir is Gugamgen. So these two young men told everybody that way they were going to get fish and they were boasting about how clever they were, you know? So they went and caught nothing. So for me, you know, the moral of the story is, you know, you do something, you just do it. You don't go and uh, boast about what you're going to do. And um, so the moral of the story is just go and do your best. And without showing off or uh, boasting about what you're going to do. centuries before there have been migratory pathways where the emus have dropped, eaten the fruit, dropped the poo and have maintained populations of these quite, quite a number of fleshy fruited plants many of which also have values for food or medicine or fibre so it's critically important that all of these creatures are uh, retained and conserved and I think more than anything at this stage in our shared history that we need to look at the increase 
And I know that people in the room have probably heard us talk about increase before, but we're at the stage now where for so many of our critical uh, elements in a, in a couple of decades, and on the Broomshead Road, a flock of 15 birds was filmed. Um, that could well be half or a third of the world's population. And within that is the, the nub or the, uh, the source population from which these coastal areas need to be increased and returned to take up their former realm. And their former realm went from Port Stephens to um, the Richmond Valley. So the fact that they've retreated to such a tiny dot on the coastline is, is deeply concerning. I, I'd like to share with you something else because I get pretty stoked about the nature that's around us. And I spend most, I won't say most, I've spent many days out and about exploring. In the last couple of days I've been doing research in some of the Burnt Gondwana country um, up in New England. But there's been a truly astonishing finding recently um, in the heart of um, uh, the edge of the New England wilderness. And there's, there's another uh, contemporary European name, New England. I mean, it's this nothing yeah. like us there. Yeah. Change it. M McGrath's <laughs> McGrath's not taking snow like. <laughs> We've got work to do. We really do. Well, Nico, you've got work yeah, to do. The rest of my life to do this. Yeah. <laughs> so this was at the very top of the Nambucco Valley, so just outside the Bellington, just outside the Kalang. And I know a few of you have probably seen these pictures. So the wombat is the end of a massive lineage. There were these critters called Deprotodons that were basically rhinoceros-sized wombats. And there's fossils of all sorts of gnarly relatives of wombats going back tens of millions of years. And there's evidence of these Deprotodons, there's really recent evidence about longer-term migration of herds, of ton and a half to two ton wombats. And some of that's been found on the Darling Downs. So they've actually looked at the, the chemical and um, radioactive signatures within their teeth, within their fossilised teeth, to ascertain that they were migratory. So there might have been some tens of different species, this, this gnarly plethora of primordial wombats. <laughs> and we thought, us scientists thought that wombats were pretty close to extinct. And north of the Oxley Highway, another name that probably needs to change it, don't change it. Yeah. <laughs> it was thought that north of the Oxley Highway that the, the common wombat or the bare-nosed wombat was and indeed still is critically endangered. And it was known that there were a couple of tiny little populations that were part of a former, much bigger, intact population of wombats. And they were in places such as Butterleaf, which is on the Great Dividing Range, um, kind of east of Gyro Glen in Estetafield. And the northernmost known population was on the New South Wales Queensland border at Ball Rock and into Gurawee, where there were maybe 50 animals. And these photos were taken, what, there's the date up there, a couple of years back now. And they're at the very edge of a block of forest which comes to the back of Bellingen here, into the Kalang and into the top of the Bellinger Valley. And that area is practically unknown to modern science because it is some of the most incredibly difficult country to get around, to walk, to explore, to take equipment in. 
And what these photos, which were taken effectively on the valley floor, so in the lowlands, at the top of the Nambucca Valley, what they tell us is that lurking in these astonishing forests that sustain us all are these trees, these wonders, these creatures, 40 kilos, the largest kind of um, ground marsupial kicking about, and they actually looked after them in captivity in days gone by, and they're a, they're a fairly formidable creature, really, when they, when they get going. They look a bit innocent and benign, but they've got a lot of strength. They've got a lot of determination. They can turn so much soil. And my understanding is that there may well be... Um, stories going back of the existence of this astonishing creature across much of the Gumbangia country. And it's been one of the most astonishing things that's come into my emails in, in recent times. There have been a few of the, 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 the EU flock was pretty good. This was, this was pretty amazing. But I guess the reason I put this up is to hopefully plant some seeds of wonder and awe that there's so much yet to come to understand about the ins and the outs of our, of our home realm, of the Gumbangia country. And there are creatures within it and plants and animals within it that I think it's really important to attach great importance to, to, to resonate with, to get absolutely stoked about. And I want nothing more than my grandchildren to be seeing wombats in abundance. And I think if we can focus in upon some of these critical species, and the dungi is definitely another one, the koala, if we can focus in on them and look after country in the right way, whereby we maintain and benefit and increase the populations of these creatures, we've got it all right. The wombat is a word for it. I've got to be careful because one vowel separates a wombat from a. Listen, is that you? Can you please tell me what the word, uh, the word for wombat is? I can't want to make a mistake. Nobody does. So there's these two words. There's two words. Is. There's an A uh and an O, uh. so we just don't get it right. Any other word that we don't say there's an A uh and an R. Uh. <laughs> wombat. Sure Tell me what the word wombat is. Goombine. Goombine. Yeah. That's the word for it's wombat. Goombine. Uh. You say gumbine, it means Gumbine. something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a story, I will tell you another story. Uh, Gumbangi people, the edge, the southern end of Gumbangi country is the Baka Baka Bindare. What's that mean? The Baka River, Baka Baka Bindare is the, uh, the southern end of Gumbangi country. To the, uh, and after the river, then you got Ngamba people. Then Ngamba, and they are a subgroup of the Dangati people that live around Bellbrook and Texas and all those guys. So these Namba people live around Scott's Head. So one day, all the Namba people left and went out. Do the Scott's Head. Oh, yeah. So they went out because there was no sea. There was no sea. So they went out to the east. All the Nyamba people walked and walked and walked and walked out to the east. They left behind two sisters. They were called Buriga. Buriga sisters, uh, Sango and her. So these two sisters were left behind while the Nyamba people walked where there, was, where there was no sea. When the Nyamba people got out of sight, hiding in a cave was a Mopo man. The Mopo man come out of the cave and went up to the younger sister and said, Hey, I want to marry you. The older sister said, You can't marry her, you've got to marry me. I don't want to marry you, I want to marry her. And then a big argument about who's going to marry who, anyway. I have to say this, didn't he magically put them to sleep? Right? And then he left them there. 
the older sister who was powerful got up and fixed herself up and fixed her younger sister up and said to the younger sister, we have to do something about the Mopo man. If he comes back and you don't marry him, he's gonna kill us. So the older sister goes into the bush, get a bowl, put some honey in there, put some water in there, and put this sap from a vine called Bigar. She brought it back. The Mopo man come. I want to marry you. Can't marry her. You're going to marry me. I don't want to marry you. You want to marry her. Anyway, the older woman, the older woman, or the older sister, gave the Mopo man the potion and he drank it. And then, all, then he transformed into a real Mopo and flew away. And that was the end of the Mopo man. The older sister then said to the younger sister, go over in the bush and bring, bring back two sticks about that long. So they brought it back and they sharpened each end and they made the first gunai. You know what a gunai is? Gunai, that's a, a, that's a, what's a spear, do you know? Gunai? And gamai. Gamai is a spear. Yeah, so, yeah. so we made a, uh, the first digging stick called a gunai. Right? And the older sister said to the younger sister, do this, hit the ground and say, ngarua, ngarua. Narawa. Naru is water, Narawa has become water. Narawa, Narawa, Narawa. Gidur is sand. She says, say, Gidur, 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 Gidur. So they started making sand and water. And then the older sister said to the younger sister, You go north and I'll go south. And they went right around going, Gidur, Gidur, Narawa, Narawa. Then they come to a place just outside of what is known as Kosala now. And they cross their gunai, their yam sticks, like that. And they formed an island called Split Solitary Island, which is now called Gunai, which to us is called Gunai Miral, the yam stick place, what the women created. And then the women, the two women then ascended into the sky and became a part of the Seven Sisters constellation. Okay? So now the number of people that went out are trapped out there because the water's coming up. So how are they going to get back? Two koala brothers. Two koala brothers. They were magic. They were animal and human of one. So the two koala brothers said, we will help you. So they got the intestines and spit it out and made a land bridge from out here all the way back. And everybody walked back across the land bridge. The land bridge is known to people from Scott's Head as Elephant's Head, there's a land bridge there. So there was a cheeky wildcat, a barlegen, a barlegen. He was threatening to chop the land bridge down so everybody falls in the water. And there's no, 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 no. And then when they all got back, the cheeky barlegen went down to the, uh, ran down to the water and started teasing the water and making these big waves. And the two koala brothers were watching him. He's going to drown us all. He's going to flood the earth. So one koala brother got on that side, the other koala brother got on this side, the barlegen was in the middle. And they sang out to the, they made a, they made a uh, deal with the ocean because he was teasing the ocean that they were, the waves were going to smash him. Right? So they sang out, hey, barlegen. The barlegen turned his back on the ocean and the waves were coming to smash him. And just as they were about to hit him, he turned around and went, munima, turned to rock. And the rock is the the, where the Surf Life Saving Club is out at um, Scott's Head. One of, the, one of the koalas then went into a cave and come up uh, to um, Old Mountain in uh, just outside of Maxwell. The other one went into a cave and come up to now the mountain that is now known as Mount Yashiopini. They used to call it Yarrapini one time ago. Yarrapini, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Yarrapini. Then they changed it to uh, Yaria Pini, but the, because it's on Ngambar country, and Ngambar is, a, is, a, uh, uh, is a, a clan of the Dangata people, the word is Yaji Yapini. Yaji Yapini. That means Yaji in the language down there is koala, and Yapini is rolling. So the, when that koala got up there, they chopped this koala into three pieces, and those pieces are the, are the peaks up there are the, uh, the koala and all the blood just flowed down onto the river. So that was a story about the sea level rising. Oh. Mm. 
and we may need to be building future stories for Steve <laughs> Rising because they're, they're coming in. I'd like to reflect upon another element to this landscape because it's something that um, is really, really near and dear to my heart and I think radiates incredible um, life and energy and elements. Can you see that? That's like a um, the core of a wagon wheel. And that's about 60 to 80 kilometres across. And at the very middle there is a feature which, once more, you names are needed. It's called the Crescent. And it's the very core of an extinct volcano, which once again means another name, it's the Eagle Volcano. And what that system is, is the largest radial drainage pattern. So by radial, radiating off the centre of the volcano. And when it, so the, 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 the highest point of that volcano is about 1,560 metres. But when it was at its peak about 18 million years ago, when it stopped erupting, because it would erupt cubic kilometres of rock at a time, giant chunks of earth, and the Dorigo Plateau is one of the greatest remnants of that volcano. It was much, much higher than Mount Kosciuszko. It was potentially well over two and a half kilometres high. So if we were looking today back to the west, the highest peaks that we could see effectively double. And what that has done is where so much of Australia has become so dry in that period, in the last 20 million years, because Australia's split apart from Antarctica, and as we're drifting to the north at about six or eight centimetres a year, the circumpolar current around Antarctica has drawn moisture away from Australia. And this volcano has kept it wet. And it's been right on the coast with mountains, let's say two and a half kilometres high. And the vast majority of that volcano has eroded out. And it's made this lush realm that we're, that we're, 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 we're meeting on tonight. That the valley floor of the Bellinger uh, Valley, the coastal flats, and this realm that we all occupy is a direct consequence, a direct result, a direct creation of this really ancient volcano. And I think it's going to give us a really rosy future because Australia is drying out, that's just a reality. And this country just creates rainfall and it holds water, it holds massive volumes of water and that even with the extreme droughts that we've been through in recent times, there's always been water in these landscapes. And that water is what sustains the football. And unlike some of the other volcanoes to the north, like Wollumbin, pretty much the whole of the middle of Wollumbin has been cleared out, the Tweed Valley. And this is all intact, and there's wombats running through it because the wombat was kind of over in about there. And the nature that exists within that volcano tells us all sorts of stories about persistence, about what it takes to survive through unimaginable periods of time. And as residents of this valley and as people who care about that, I, I'd really um, commend to you to try to gain exposure to it, to have experiences with these, these ancient gifts and to do what we can together to give these ancient gifts 
a future because our future is their future. And there's really, really strong evidence that this river, where the, the brothers, the boys came in and, and put their spears in, that the aquatic ecosystems within that river literally extend back to before the extinction of the dinosaurs. There are insects, turtles, crayfish, and a host of other elements to the river that tell us that it's literally amongst the most ancient and stable of aquatic ecosystems, freshwater aquatic ecosystems, on the planet. And it's flowing past us there right now. And that's just something that I get so blown away about. Um, there really are no words to describe how special that is and how fortunate we are to be sustained by that. Because we all are. All our drinking water, all our food, the air that we have, the carbon that is stored in it. Um, the other day I was, we had 40 mils of rainfall on Monday night. Yeah, and then the next day the clouds went. And I'm standing there looking at the forest. And there wasn't, the, the clouds had all gone. And I was watching a column of rainfall materialised at a 150 metre column above this patch of old growth forest. And that's self maintenance. And that's what survival and life and the future is all about. That these systems, the essence of life, if given the right love and care and nurturing attention, will continue, it will look after itself, it will sustain itself, and it will sustain us. What do I say? Well said, brother. I was up there a couple of weeks ago camping. Can you put that? You were camped out there. Oh, it's beautiful, really beautiful, right up, right under the water. It's so amazing up there. You know, it's beautiful. How long we got? No, I've got good enough time for another story. Yeah. You know, well, that's all Gumbanga country. Yeah? Gumbanga people live there. Does anybody know how we live there? Like, do you know anything about moieties and clans and all that stuff? Where I come from, Tinebaka Heads, that's my clan area. That's my bari, Baga Baga. I'm we known as a Baga Baga clan, and there's all clans dotted all over uh, the Kumbangia country where they where people live. Does anybody know the clan name that from here? The Bellington clan, Leslie. Budaba. Everybody say Budabang. Budabang was the name of the Kumbangia people that occupied in this area. For thousands of years, Buddha, Buddha, they were Umbangia, Umbangia. So one day, the Buddha people went up the Bellington River all the way. Now, went all the way up. To the um, mountains, the Buddha Bang people, they made camp up there. And the men said to the women, Make your fires small, because the fierce Naku people who live around um, uh, Southwest Rocks, who are another clan group of the Dangaki people, will uh, patrol the area. They said, make your fires small, they said to the women and children. Of course, they were going out hunting. They got a, they got a boy. They got a boy. Waru Junoi Ni Dinda? Waru Junoi. His name is Waru Junoi. Waru is who? And Junoi, small. So I don't think he was quite initiated yet. And they took him to the mountain. And they said to this boy, you sit here over this mountain and watch 
on the, down to the where the women and children are. If you see the narco people coming, you give them a warning so they can escape. So the men left him up there. And then he, all the men went hunting. A couple of days later, they come back to the camp and the women and the children were all gone. And then they looked up on the mountain to where the boy was. And they walked up to the mountain and they saw this boy sleeping up on the mountain. So for his punishment, they left him there sleeping. He's still there today, looking over the Bellington Valley. The boy cried because he let his people down and he got punished for it. And the waterfalls, the tears that he cried is all the waterfalls that are around, around in the Bellington, uh, the mountains up the top there. So Waru Junoi. So that was the that was the story about the old man. They call it they call him old man. The old man dreaming or old man sleeping. That's the story about that fellow. So the Buddha our people lived here. Hmm? I don't know. Hey, you know what? That is okay in Gumbanka culture. Listen. Silence is really okay in Gumbanka culture. Isn't it beautiful? Like if we were living in, if we were living in a clan, right? You know, people everywhere. So for them to escape, they would just sit quiet. And if, if everybody else is chatting, and someone's sitting quiet over there, they know that person wants to be alone. Right? They just let, let, them, let them be. So silence is very good in, in my culture. Yeah? Don't worry, Ruba. We should do it lots more. Sit in silence and listen to the land. I, I was at Uranga Preschool. Um, with three, four, and five-year-olds, right? There was about 20 of these guys. And I said, hey, shh. I said, listen. And they all went quiet. A couple of them were moving up a little bit. And I said, what did you hear? The wind was really loud. And they all said the wind. I said, shh, have a good listen. Really listen hard. So they all went real quiet again, and then a little bird over and over and there. And it was just faint. And I said, what did you hear? And they said, little bird. And then there's a the car drove past, you know, like, and then the car drove past. You know, so it's just sitting there and listening, because we don't, we don't hear a lot of stuff. When we're out there, we, we only hear what we want to hear. But if you listen, deep listening, deep, deep listening, but then, when you do that, then you really, really connect to the country, to the country. You know, um, there are spiritual forces all everywhere. You know that spiritual forces. And um, you feel, you can feel those spiritual forces wherever you go. You know, even, even um, you know, people. They're, they're, you, can feel their, you can feel their spirit as well. So, you know, it's, it's okay. We've got a word for that, we say, there's a few words for spirit. There's lots of words for spirit. One is waki, the other one is gunj, gumpu. What's another one? Jina? Moya. 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 Moya is breath, and it also means spirit. Um, moya, mo, there's a story about the Wujia of Jami, and she says moya gariwa to these guys, and then become breath, Moya Gariwa. But Gumega people and uh, you know they they had a special special connection to every part of the land that they lived in. Every part. And all the animals, all the trees, the water, everything was special. They had totems, plants, animals, all with totems. Um, you know, my totem the, the Gumega people's totem. Does anybody know the whole of the Gumega nation's people's totem? Gargle. Who said gargle? Yes. Gargle. Do you anybody know what a gargle is? Ocean. So that ocean is the totem of all Gumega people. And
and then the bird that when we was playing that uh, before the bird is called a nian, a little bird like that is the uh, women's totem, and the, the men's totem is a little micro bat called a girimari. Girimari, that's the men's totem. The women's totem is a little uh, nian tree creeper, and the uh, the old pit, the uh, people is the ocean. And then my family totem is the shark, which is a young guy, and then on my mother's side it is a red bass. So that, you know, and we've got my, my section name, my skin name is Marul, my father was Wambul, my mother was Guran, my sister is Gargan, and my wife would have been Wangan. And then, you know, we all had these special names and special, everybody in Mumbai country was related by, if it wasn't by blood, it was related by kinship. So if I'm a Marul man, right, in their bucket heads, I go up to Gaira, and they got the same kinship system up there, like Marul and Wambo. I go into their clan, and I say, I'm a Marul man. The people will go, hey, you Marul, he's Marul, that's your brother. There's Guran, that's your mother. There's Wirbyan, that's your mother-in-law, stay away from You know, we, we, we have that relationship with their mother-in-law, you know? You know, you know all, over, all over Australia, I think that is. I don't, know, I don't know if it's in the white fellow one, but it's in the blue one. That, that your mother-in-law was... <laughs> you, have, you, have special, you have a special relationship with your mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, uh, the, um, uh, one of the old fellows said, you know, if your mother-in-law come in, you don't talk directly to her, you don't look at her, or, you know, uh, just if you want to say something, you say something to the glass. Hello. <laughs> that, means, that means hello to you. You know, so you don't talk directly to him. Yeah. And I think that was because uh, that if something goes wrong within the, within the marriage, that the mother-in-law has a fair, um, you know, understanding of who, how to deal with it without having advice against the, the son-in-law. Um, yeah. But, you know, we did have a, you know, you got, there's marriages, right? Marriages. So if, I, if I'm a moral man, I marry a wild woman, right? There was a divorce file. We could get, we could get divorced. <laughs> Leslie, tell them what the divorce thing is. Do you know what? Okay, well, all I know is if a woman is not happy in her marriage and she would like to divorce, there's a tree up near Grafton called the marriage tree or the divorce tree. <laughs> the divorce tree. And, you know, if you're really serious about I cannot live with this man, Okay, here's your axe. You climb up that tree and cut off that branch, and then you're free of the marriage. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, if you're in a divorce, you know, climb a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear anything about if a man wanted to divorce, but what his wife was. Mmm, man. Top, top secret stuff. <laughs> uh, so, questions? Do you have any questions? Or do you want to say something? My question about kinship is, if you have kinship with others through the, what's your kinship with the animal that you're kin with? So you're sharp, what's your kinship with that animal? I've got lots of totems, the, 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 the Giri Marin, the little micro bat, the ocean, the young guy which is a shark, and then um, the uh, red bass, and, the, the, and also my, um, one of my Moetri names is lots of uh, uh, totems. One of the things was that if my totem was a koala, a, a dungia, right, and all, we went out hunting, all the men that belonged to the totem of the dungia could never touch that, can't touch it. They can't touch the dungia. So it saves everybody going out killing all the dungia. So there was only certain people who could touch it and kill the dungia. So it was like, you know, we can't we can't eat or uh, kill our uh, totems, and all these everybody in the Mumbai area had all these totems that they couldn't touch. Yeah, so you know, and it's like it's our totem. Like for me, the Giri Martin, When I see a Giri Martin flying around at night, I, I, get, I get really really excited. You know. Because uh, you see how fast those creatures go? They are so deadly, eh? 
And so, so when I go to the ocean, I jump in the ocean. Uh, you know, I, it, it, it energizes me, it heals me. The old people used to say that that thing is like a human. The ocean, you can, you can uh, talk to it, you can make it angry, or you can appease it. So that ocean was like a person. And, um, you know, when, when I go there, I always say, uh, so the old people, when they went on country somewhere, when they went into the country, like they camped on one time, right? And they left that camp in one season, they went to another place, they would say those words, I am a friend, I've come back to see you, but don't be angry. These are all my families, and these are my friends. But don't harm us. This is my land, this is your land, therefore let's be friends. They spoke to the land to ask permission to be inside that land. And then they, when they went again, they went again, and they went, kept the moon. By the time they come back to this area, it was all replenished again for food. And they asked, they asked permission. The Kumbaya people asked the spirits, asked the land, if we can go on there and not to harm it. I always wondered if part of the reason for animal touch or any sort of touch is in that huge geographical area, that tribe um, means that that species will always be preserved so that you can take a whole continent. There's always going to be healthy breeding populations there. Um, and that's a way of ensuring um, the survival of the species. Species. You know, um, you know the uh, uh, respecting the autonomy of every living thing and every inanimate thing, like water, ocean, trees, animals. That you know don't don't threaten the existence of anything. Why should we? Why should? Why should we lose? All these beautiful, beautiful insects and creatures. You know, and it's not only happening in space, it's happening all over the world. It's, you know, but you know, if we, if we can, uh, you know, the more knowledge of Kumbhanga people and indigenous people say, all right, how do you guys keep this land the way it was? You know, how did you do that? You know, uh, by kinship systems, by, uh, you know, totems, Gentle fire burning, you know, and treating the land with respect as as a person, as a being, and not going in there to uh, destroy it and harm it, but to live with it. That's what people need to know that this planet that we're on is a living thing that we need to look after. All, all of us. Everybody, all the, all the people who live in Wolbanga country, everybody. Nicola, I reckon we've got to get you into Microbat Central. Microbat. Up there, that's the Karindi River Valley. So that's the, the hinterland of Wulgurga. That landscape, so Australia's got uh, 150 to 200 microbats in that valley up there. There are 32 microbat species, so from the, the banks of the Karindi River up onto the sandstone country, the Sherwood sandstone country, that's a significant proportion of all the continent's microbats. And that's Garvey country, and... Garvey is a wallaby. And that, that's, that's not particularly well known, but they're... These microbats function across all sorts of different parts of the landscape. So the one that's down on the river is the fishing bat. They sweep their feet through the top of the water, water body to catch insects and small fish. And then there's bigger bats that fly higher above the water catching flying insects. And then there's much bigger, really fast flying bats that go right across the top and they fly like nothing else. There's one, the, the yellow-bellied sheep tail bat. It's got this 
full whitey yellow belly and it, it's like a fighter pilot bat. And then you go into the rainforest and there's one called the golden tip bat. And they've got these little hairs that crisp over. They kind of curve over and on the edge of that curve is like a drop of liquid gold. And they, they flutter. They're like a helicopter bat. And they're in rainforest. And they're using their ultrasonic detection, their sonar, to flutter around, figure out where there's a spider web, flutter up to it, and delicately pick the spider out of the centre of the spider web. <laughs> and that's, that's just three or four of them that we know a bit about. Like, we've got to get you to Karindi. <laughs> I want him to come to my school. <laughs> Kids need to hear this stuff, you know? They, they need to understand, you know, if we, get, if we can get into the schools, that'd be great. Anyway, the Giri Martin site is, for the back, is that hungry head. There's one up the back there. Yeah, I've got a question about uh, living in harmony with uh, the creatures. Um, what about the tiger and the elephant? Are they are pure for them. <laughs> you need those things. I'll, I'll replace it in upon the poor old leech. Oh yeah. Um, they've been around 270 or so many years. Long, 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 long time. And we went through three years of probably unprecedented drought. There's emerging evidence that the desiccation that happened around here, the prolonged drought, was beyond anything in... In, in history. And people who've lived on properties that are leech havens, self-included, basically on a normal times you'd kind of go to the back deck, you'd step onto the earth and you'd have 20 leeches on you in seconds. And I started to compile as, as the drought got more and more intense, I started to compile reports from the front, and I'm, I've kind of plugged into a few networks across the north coast, and it became apparent that people who'd been custodians of particular pieces of land for decades, some of them 40 or 50 years, were to a person in these tick havens noticing the disappearance or the near complete disappearance of leeches. And it got to be that critical that every single leech I'd come across I'd film it. And people think I was completely stark raving mad, and I probably am, but um, it literally got to this stage where every single leech that presented itself became a delight. And with the return of the rains, there's been a marginal return in leeches. But all these people who made reports from the front, I don't think anybody's noted a return to the types of numbers that existed before that 36 month drought. And it may be that it's now going to take a prolonged wet phase for their numbers to build up. And we don't know that much at all about them. As for ticks, I'd be pretty happy to <laughs> never come across them again. Right? There's no redeeming features there. Um, leeches, yeah, they're pretty wholesome as far as I'm concerned. Um, I once radio tracked frogs for 90 days in the hinterland of Wollumba, so at a place called Mebbin at the top of the Tweed Valley. And it rained for about 28 days straight. So I had these, this was 1998, and these were these really early funky transmitters that were about 400 bucks a pop. And I was a student, budgets were tight, so I needed to be with these, the giant bark frogs, so Australia's largest ground frog, 13 centimetre females, they're an endangered species, and I made these little harnesses, and I needed to be with those animals every day. So I'm in a little dome tent, in the rainforest at the back of Wollumba. And by like day 20 of persistent rain, the forest floor in front of me, because they're detecting our carbon dioxide that we emit, 
the whole forest floor would wave in a synchronized sense. And I'd wake up with them in my mouth and my ears and my eyes, and I won't tell you where else. <laughs> That's another one of those stories. So, frankly, I became an absolute one with Leech. And you just, you just surrender. Like, you cannot, don't fight. Just go with the flow. Ticks, though, nah. And I don't know whether anybody here is going to defend ticks. <laughs> Jinda. Um, I love the way when you were talking about photos that you described the person belonging to the total contrasting to like our dominant system of law which kind of imposes this sense of property ownership over something, Gumbangia has this beautiful way of locating the person within the system of non-human non -human world. Um, I'm curious as to whether you think it might be possible to kind of instigate a totem system like now. I'd love to do that. You know, all you people in this room, you know, you can, you can, um, uh, I know that you, uh, you know, animals, you got, you, I know you got favorite animals that you like, you know, even ticks. <laughs> but, you know, that, that you, you know, take care of. You know, like in, in, in our, in Bombay, you way, that we were giving, we were given these totems at birth by our ancestors from way, way, way back. You know, and we were taught about each and every one of these creatures that we were uh, um, what was, was to look after, and we also have special places for these creatures where we go and do ceremony to increase the uh, the productivity of these creatures. We've got a blue tongue lizard side, we've got a kangaroo side, we've got all sides, every, everything, every animal, animal, and every creature, and every plant. So when we go there. We do ceremony to increase this. We, you have to know where the the breeding is and when the breeding is and what to take and what not to take and how much to take. You know, we only had two numbers in our language: garagun and bullet. If you had three, that's a lot. You know, three kangaroos, that's too much. You know, only had two numbers, so we only took what we needed. And nothing went to waste. You know, and when you talk about totems and people having totems, you know, you can you can you can make a sanctuary sanctuary for uh, an animal, you know, like, like the emu or the koala, and you know, and then you get people to go in there and study these uh, creatures and say, hey, you you in charge of this place, you look after these animals, you in charge of you go to the you go to the ocean, you're gonna look after the shark or look after the octopus or look at you know, and find out as much as you can. Everybody needs to do that, you know, and, and find out what, how these creatures are going, you know, and, and do ceremony. And thank these creatures, thank the land, thank us, because they, they give us life. Without these things, we're gone. Yeah? I'd love to tell a quick story about Arlegen, so the tiger quoll, the spotted tail quoll. Um, since the mid-1980s, I've been quite intimately involved in the Coffs Harbour Botanic Gardens. As a young kid, I was lucky to be kind of planting trees and a bit involved there and doing stuff with Alex Floyd. And in the very middle of the Botanic Gardens is an old swamp mahogany that was probably felled a hundred years ago. And in the very middle of that Botanic Gardens in the I call it the heart of green. There's actually old growth forest in the very middle of Coffs Harbour. So since 1985, I've been watching this log and we've got a nine-year-old son and since he's been a little bub, we've been going there. It's the mossy, mossy log. And about three or four months ago, I was at the mossy, mossy log and there was a dollop of predator poo on top. And I thought, good heavens, that looks like a quoll poo. And I just thought, nah, I don't know, because a fox got up there, it just, it's not right. And then I started noticing a lot more action around this log. It's a massive old swamp mahogany with a pipe. 
and uh, over a hundred years it's been covered in thick moss, five, seven, eight centimetres of moss. And it actually was a quoll, so in the very middle of 40,000 people, and it had started excavating a network of runways and dens through this hundred year fallen hollow log, and it's made this intricate network of runways, and it's put dollops of poo at strategic marker points atop that network of pipes that it's created. So, you know, for a hundred years this log had been on the ground, and then this quoll came down probably off Bruxner Park, made its way through the creek corridor, which has been benefiting for 20 years now from this incredible revegetation and regeneration program, an increased program. And that gave this quoll the pathway to the heart of green. And it's there right now. It's been there for three or four months. So all around us are opportunities for connection, for totemic celebration, and for increase. And if you told me a year ago there's a, there's a, a Balajan dwelling within the Mossy Mossy Log, I would have laughed at you. You know, these things, like Mother Nature has such... The essence of the land has such an inherent capacity to survive and ultimately to thrive. We've just got to set in place the right conditions, the respect, the space, the goodwill, the tending, the custodianship to allow for those increased processes to play out. Beautiful. That reminds me of a saying, or this thing, uh, I don't know where I read it, was stuck in my head and it said uh, I invite the intelligence around me to be the intelligence within me you know when you're out in the country and I was like wow that is amazing I love that you know and I, and I kept it and I kept it and I kept it so every time I'm going out on the country and I look at all the stuff that is beautifully beautifully just connected and how these things um, you know Nature and perfect. Dharma. And we'll put this. Has he got a question? Are you in? Which floor are you going to? Oh, I used to teach up there many years ago. Casarinas, Dharma. Three, four, and five. Oh, sorry, did that oh, 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 next next Monday with you. <laughs> yes, you have to ring me up and remind me and send me a message. All right. Well, we could probably go out all night and next week too. Um, but I think we're going to. It's a bit. It's a little bit after nine o'clock. So, do you either one of you want to say any last thing that you feel like you haven't said? Oh, it's it's just been a delight to share the evening with you all and look forward to um, not necessarily being in a hall. I think being on country is paramount and I'd encourage all of you to do the, the silent thing, to be present wherever it might be because these are, these are the most powerful of times and they're incredibly challenging times individually, socially, kind of civilization-wide, but I think that giving focus to every millimeter of life that surrounds us is a salve, is a solution to um, potentially all, if not many, many if not all of our woes. And that focus upon life presses evolutionary buttons, like we actually need that. And that can be the simplest of practices, the simplest of daily observations, you know. It might be watching a skink scurry from your back deck and giving it the time and the respect 
to marvel at the way that it moves, the way that it draws energy from the sun and speeds itself up. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd probably just conclude by saying delve into life because that's really where it's at.